Welcome back to another victory video. My name is Coach Chris Haddad, and today we have Chris Parker joining us from parkerresources.org. And if you haven't seen this website, this website is absolutely loaded with resources here. It's built to help coaches and ADs get better relationship communication, organization, and presentation. Uh, we're going to dissect this website in just a minute, but Chris, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk about this website, your book, which we're going to talk about, and also some templates that I think you coaches are going to get some value from. So uh, Chris, thanks again. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, Chris. You guys do a great thing for coaches and um, what well, we try to do the same and really um, happy to be a part of it and really excited to um, share with you guys some things we're doing and also um, hopefully share to the people that know my stuff some of the things you guys are doing at Victory too, because really supportive of you all. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And you know, just taking a look at Parker Resources here, uh, and we're looking at the premium screen, and it, over three hundred templates are available uh, for you, coaches, your ads. You can be a head coach, assistant coach, whatever it may be. It, you don't have to be the head guy to be organized, right? And that's I think yeah, one of the things right. that we're going to look at today is that organization can come from all levels that's of right. coaching here. Uh, so, Chris, I want you to talk a little bit more about what we're seeing here with the premium access uh, and Parker resources and what someone's actually getting uh, when they join Parker resources and the things you have available. Right. Well, you know, you have to go back to the beginning and what happened with me, Chris, is I, um, I quit coaching. I was a longtime head coach. I became a district athletic director. And then uh, about 10 months ago or so, I became the um, director of human resources. And when that happened, I was completely out of sports. I was completely out of a team for the first time in probably about 20 years, 25 years counting my playing time. And so, uh, I just started putting these things out on Twitter that uh, we did. You know, I put out in the things I share with you today, some of the first things we put out where we just put out how we did our in game. You know, I just always had a plan for everything. We always had the thing. And people that knew me knew that. And I'd constantly get these emails that say, hey, man, send me your, uh, can you send me your coach responsibilities thing you gave your coaches? And I'd send it to them. Well, something about it, uh, somebody emailed me in, this in February when it started. And, I just said, you know what, I'm just going to put it on Twitter for anybody that wants it. I'm not coaching. You know, I'm not the AD anymore. Help some people out. And it just kind of took off. And, you know, I had 70 or 80 messages that day of, hey, can you email me that thing you put on Twitter or whatever it is. So then I started going through all the stuff. And I just always was really organized and had detailed plans for everything. And I start putting things out every few days. Well, about that time COVID hits and everybody's at home and all that. And so uh, it just became something where people were constantly – needing that hey let me get a copy of that where i could make that for my team and we just kind of saw a need there that i didn't really identify when i was coaching it took the me taking a bigger view and backing away from it and saying there was a need here to educate some people and help them and it just the feeling that we got chris and i know you can attest to this and maybe most of your listeners may not be able to but it's a really it's a great feeling to see a kid achieve on the field it's a great feeling to see a coach that's on your staff achieve but it's a whole nother great feeling to see somebody you never met that genuinely is seeing your stuff and saying, man, that coach, that made my team better. Thank you. Like that just was a great feeling. I didn't really expect. And so we tried to package it stuff in a way where I couldn't send hundreds of emails a day to everybody that wanted everything. Yeah. And I thought, you know, we're going to take a look at uh, three. You were gracious enough to send us three of the templates, which we're going to show you in just a minute. So if you want to get a sneak peek, uh, stick around for a few more minutes. We're going to pull those up. But I, I, one last point I want to touch on before we get to those templates. I thought you you made a great point when we were talking earlier. You hire teachers and you give them all the resources. You give them all the training. And then you hire a coach and just kind of expect him to have it all. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have it all as a coach. Most coaches learn the hard way, figure it out as Absolutely. they're going obviously your website will help them in that process yeah. of getting them. And that's what we want to do is give them opportunity. Because like I was telling you, you know, I was an AD and then I was the district AD and we hire all these coaches. We hire these people fresh out of college. And a lot of times they, let's not, let's not BS anybody. Sometimes they're getting the job because they agreed to coach the soccer team, you know, and, and they don't know anything about soccer or definitely anything about dealing with parents or budgets or money. And we've given them all this training for their teaching job but hired them because they'll coach soccer and then don't tell them anything about how to coach soccer. And I'm not talking about where to put the players on offense and defense. I'm talking about how to deal with these parents, how to have a plan, how to have a calendar, how to stay organized, how to communicate. We don't give them any of that professional training. And, and then, you know, two or three years later, you're looking for a new soccer coach. And the first example they want to look at now is the in-game template. 
uh, that Chris has on his website. And, and Chris, I love this. This You're breaking this down from on-field to film room. Even at the very bottom of the screen here, you can see sideline organization. I mean, this has literally everything that you possibly need. Uh, walk me through how you created this and walk me through just each little piece here, if you don't mind just brushing up on each one. Yeah, well, you know, what we did was, and this was a real form I used. That's why I sent you this one. There's another form on there that doesn't have these people's names on there. And there's another form that you can download you know, and, and send word and make your own thing like this. But this was a real form we used. It's not something I made to sell. We gave our coaches, we had a meet. we always had a plan. We always had it written down. We were going to go with our coaches. We're going to sit down once a year anyway and go through this whole thing. And so we had maybe say we had 11 or 12 coaches. Each one of them should be in each box, basically. So I had a pregame sheet like this where all – you know, 11 or 12 guys were going to have an assignment from 3.30 to, say, 5, then another assignment from 5 to kickoff. Then in kickoff is what you're seeing here. You know, you're talking about offenses on the field. These are the guys. Somebody's calling to play, somebody's signaling, somebody's subbing, somebody's doing a press box. When the offense was off the field, so the defense is on the field, what was every coach's job? You know, because our guys coached one side of the ball. So when the defense was on the field, then we were watching film on the sideline uh, or somebody was charting a play or somebody was doing the breakdown stuff to tell me I was calling the plays in that case. But the same was true on defense. You know, we had we had that, and then we could even expand upon what did it mean to say film analysis. Well, that might be different year to year as we got better or learned from people like you on different things we could do in the game. But the general premise was these were the people that did it. You know, then you get down to kind of the generic things where, you know, and I found stuff as simple as just like equipment. You know, we went through and talked about, okay, Johnny's helmet breaks. Who is in charge of getting him a new helmet? Mm. We ain't got, you know, I don't know where everybody here listening coaches, but where I coached, you know, it was going to be the best player that helmets came off, of course, because that was my luck. And, and we were going to have to have him. It was going to be like fourth and two, you know, or something. And so we got to figure out what the plan is. And you would think, Chris, something as simple as us sitting in a room with 10 guys, 11 guys sitting around the table and saying, now what are we going to do if somebody's helmet breaks? What are we going to do if somebody loses a shoe? And, and somebody had to be in charge of that. And just by having that conversation, we were way more prepared yeah. than th if that really <laughs> happened. And then, like you said, the sideline organization, it was very important to me that we looked like we knew we were supposed to be on the sideline. You know, I don't know how every state is, but in Georgia, you know, they let you watch film on the sideline. So, it was important everybody went where they were supposed to be. And if we had defensive reserves, we knew that side of the fields where the, the young defensive players were. If we need to grab somebody, there they were. We said we had um we had cones and different things set up to identify this little chart you got down there and probably got as many compliments on the sideline organization as anything else. I don't know if that's good or bad about me. I mean, we did win some games, you know, but people seem to be more – we did stay back. You know, our coaches were where they're supposed to be. Our players were where they're supposed to be. I mean, we – and, and if nothing else, Chris, when, when you're coaching, half the battle is being organized, having talking about it ahead of time, but also presenting yourself to your administration, to your fans, to your parents that, hey, we got a plan. We're not going to win every single game because, you know, that's impossible. But we can have a plan. Like we can be organized. We can do the best we can do. And sometimes just as simple as people knowing where to go on the sideline yep. shows everybody that's looking because everybody doesn't see your practice. Everybody doesn't see – your film room, everybody doesn't see your meeting room, but everybody sees that game. So. Yeah, the first thing that really jumped out at me was football's a chaotic game as it is. High emotions flying around. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a contact sport. But you know, my, in my eye, clear, you know, clear minds think straight, right? So mm -hmm. if you can get organized, everybody on the same page, no one's being chaotic. Everyone's thinking straight and doing their tasks and their responsibilities. And that's when I first saw this, that was the first thing that came to my mind was oh, damn, he's really got everybody organized and they know exactly what they're doing. And like I said, a, a good head coach will do that where everyone knows their role on the sideline. They're not running up and down as a cheerleader. They're mm -hmm. doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, and mm -hmm. that's how good teams essentially are, are, are made from. Now, the next document that we're going to look at is the staff roles and responsibilities. And, Coach, we're seeing leadership, offense, special teams, practice, scouting. I'm even looking at medical on this uh, this piece of paper here. So what are we looking at when we're looking at staff roles and responsibilities? And in your mind, how did you limit it down to these different uh, categories that you have listed here? Well, this started as a list of things so I didn't forget anything on the individual sheets like we just showed you. So, for example, if you look over where it says games, there's during the day, pre-game, in-game. Basically, everything that's in-game is on that other sheet. Everything that's post-game would be basically all these kind of categories have their own piece of paper telling everybody what to do. But 
it started out as my way of not forgetting something. Because we talked about, for example, we talked about having somebody there to help fix equipment. But what if you as a head coach never assigned anybody to fix equipment? That's a very honest mistake. I mean, a lot of people would do that. There's no shame in that. So I just kept a running list of everything. So this doesn't have people's names, but these are basically just jobs that about every July or toward the end of June, first of July, I just sat down and started scratching through things as I assigned them to people. And so then this became something that works well on Twitter or works well in this setting because it's not about my team. Yep. You may have five coaches and they still got to divide all this stuff up. You may have 20 coaches and you got to divide all this stuff up. It, it doesn't matter if you're the smallest school in Massachusetts or the biggest one. They have to do these things. Mm -hmm. You may call it something slightly different or whatever, but you guys have to do all these things. So somebody has to be assigned to these things. So, so if I took a coach, like if you come down from Massachusetts and coach with me, Chris, we're going to say, okay, Chris, we're going to give you one of these leadership roles. You know, pretty much everybody was going to get one. I'm sure there was one or two that didn't. And maybe your leadership role was I need you to – Look after, be over technology. You know, you're good with the computer. You show it, make us the best technology place in the state of Georgia. Tell me what we got to have, who we need to hire, whatever. Then, so your general, you're going to have a general role. Your general role might be technology. It might be over the locker room. You just, something as simple as all, you know, anybody needs a locker, they go see coach, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody on the staff knows that. Everybody's got one of those general jobs. Everybody's got scouting jobs. You know, you probably got a self-scouting job, an upcoming opponent scouting job. And then a practice plan job, you know, then you're going to come over here and you're going to coach either offense or defense. So you got those responsibilities. You're going to coach something on these special teams. And then you're going to have a pre-practice, a post-practice, a pre-game and a post-game responsibility. So I could give you a list, Chris, of these eight or nine things you're over. So when somebody says this, go see coach. But I have really genuinely told these people what to do and let them grow with it. So if we put you over technology or we put you over, you know, working with our youth programs or we put you over – uh, academics, then you come up with the best damn academic plan that's ever been known to man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was supported. I'll help you if you need some help. But but it is our job as the head coach to give those guys a little nudge of direction and then see if they can take the ball and run with it, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, like you said, is huddle, right? So if you know that the huddle's not uploaded, there's one guy to go to. There's not a head coach going to a staff and saying, why didn't we upload huddle? And all the mm -hmm. coaches kind of look at each other like, uh, I thought you were doing it. I thought you were doing it. Or I'll even worse. Something else, Chris. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. If you get like, think about something with huddle and think about it practice. Even the guy, the guy that's supposed to go upload huddle probably doesn't need to be the one that's cleaning up the sideline mm -hmm. or doing something else because that's going to take a few minutes. So he needs to immediately go in when we start addressing the team, now these other guys got field cleanup, these other guys, and all that meshes together because we get and, – and unfortunately, I don't mean this to be critical of anybody, but there's people out there that the guy that's over the field cleanup or the guy that runs the kids after practice, that's also the guy that uploads huddle. Well, now you've slowed everybody down. And the third and final template that we're going to look at is the annual program calendar. And this is uh, – Coach, this is essentially something you took directly from your coaching days. And every single month, uh, you just detailed every single thing that you need to do leading up to the season as well as in the off season. So I'll let you talk on this uh, as we start to pan through what's actually happening uh, in the annual program calendar. Right. Well, and this, this particular document is geared toward the head coach. This is things that I thought – this is more my personal list. And so some of it is going to be for Pickens High School or for Chapel Hill or the schools I worked at. But – this is the list I made for myself to do each month. And like I said, over 20 years, I just updated it every year. You know, what did I not do? What did I do in January that wasn't on this list? And I added or whatever. And you just, so, the head coach is so easy to forget stuff. And, you know, we're so easy to be behind. Or when do we schedule the officials last year? Or when do we sign up for that clinic? Or when do we, whatever it was. And so I, I just had to keep up with it this way. And this particular document is probably the one that gets, the uh the most attention i don't know if it's the most popular as far as helpful i don't even know how helpful this is for anybody i just think people need to make their own version of this mm -hmm. you know they need to make their own version of this but it can give you an idea how you need to figure out because basically it's like what's important this month what do i need to do daily and what do i need to do you know on my to-do list this month and so yeah i think this is good too to keep head coaches on track because i feel like when you're out of season, you maybe fall into that limbo a little bit where you're 
you know, you're a little bit too far away to start doing X and O's and maybe you're starting mm -hmm. to pick up some new things on Twitter, but this will keep you locked in and like, okay, you know, I see post birthdays, football research, uh, check out the clinics, doing active head coaching responsibilities, not falling into that limbo, especially around like the December, January ish time where right. it's the holiday time. You can kind of sit back a little bit. This will actually give you, mm -hmm. uh, actionable items that you need to accomplish today uh, and also throughout the month. So those are the templates that we just took a look at. Now we're going to look at uh, Chris's new book, 10 Lessons in Coaching. And coach, I actually wanted to break down a few of these lessons here and the things that you've learned over the years as a coach. Uh, you know, three in particular really stood out to me. The first one is having a plan, which I think we just covered in the last couple of temp right. templates, but I want you to graze over that a little bit uh, before we jump into the next two of having a plan. Yeah, well, I mean, like we've been talking about, I just think, you know, and, and this book, Chris, goes back. This book is really significant to me because it, it was a reflection on my 20 years. Really having the plan is the things I'm just saying, like, don't wait to mess up and then start writing this stuff down. Like, have a plan. It's hard to have a plan, Chris. Sounds yeah. really easy. Yeah. Have a plan. But yeah. it's going to be hard for y'all to sit down in that coach's office and take that list I posted or you posted a few minutes ago and genuinely give everybody those jobs that takes work it's going to take a few hours so when you compound that time to millions of other things you guys have to do it's hard to have a plan but if you want to win this is one of these 10 lessons you've got to have a plan you got to write it down yeah and the second piece that we're going to talk about is over communicating and as we just saw in the last templates you know, coach, I know you like to be over prepared. Let's talk about over communicating because I think uh, that is probably one of the main cornerstones of coaching that I think a good head coach does is he over communicates to his staff and his players rather than under communicating. And that's, I think that's where things start to go a little bit haywire. So let's talk about right. over communicating. Well, and in the book, we talk about the different groups you communicate with. So there's, there's a way you over communicate to parents and to players and to administrators and to the coaches of the other sports. So if you're a football coach, you need to communicate with the basketball coach, you know, and the baseball coach. Don't wait on them or don't send them some email that maybe they didn't get and then say, well, I told them. No, that's not good enough. The job is, did they get the message? So, I, you know, the mantra is, how are we going to communicate with these people? And it really comes down to three different ways we communicate with these groups. And I, I, I call it uh, formal, informal, and impromptu. So like with a player, we're going to have a formal meeting with them, you know, a couple times a year scheduled. Hey, I'm going to see every kid for 10, 15 minutes each, sit them down, talk about how they're doing in the weight room, how their, their goals, their, their plan, whatever it is. That's formal. They scheduled it. We pump them up, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. There's the informal communication where you're going to um, bump into them. And I say bump in parentheses because a lot of times I did it on purpose. You know, I'm going to go in the lunchroom. I'm going to take a roster and I'm going to bump into every kid in the next couple of days in lunch. I'm just going to ask them how things are going. Talk to them about something other than football. You know, kind of have that in, that time. And then the impromptu communications are when you didn't plan it either formally or informally. You know, Johnny wants to come in your office and talk to you about why he's not playing quarterback. You didn't know that conversation was about to happen, but now it is going to happen, and you got to be ready to communicate. You've got this is a great chance to share your vision with him, and that's with the players. Same could be said for coaches. We're going to have a formal coach meeting. We're going to bump into coaches and kind of talk to them, messing around at the basketball game or whatever. And then we're going to have times where that coach wants to know why he's not getting promoted, and you sit down and really have a hard conversation with that coach, but you you get that vision across. See, all that's communication, Chris, and what a lot of people miss is we got to communicate. And when you started this topic, a lot of people might have thought, yeah, we got to do a better job of telling them when practice changed. We do 100 percent. We got to do a better job of that. But that's not what this is all about. It's really about everything you're doing is communicating your vision. If you're being sorry, you're communicating a sorry vision. If you're sitting nothing, if you're telling them at 210 that practice changed at 230, you're communicating a sorry vision, yeah. even if you didn't mean to. So everything in communication, communication is everything, I guess is what I'm saying. It's everything you're doing, even if you're not communicating, even if you're nonverbal, if you bumped into them, if you planned it, whatever, those are all opportunities for you to convey your vision. So if your vision is we're going to be this, and I'll give you a great example. You ever met any coaches? I mean, you guys work with hundreds of coaches. You ever met any of them that wanted to lose? You ever right. met any of them right. that didn't? You know, I love when people get on here and say, well, I'll tell you what, my teams are – 
you know, we're going to get after it. Has anybody ever not wanted to get after it? I mean, of course they're going to, you know, but who actually gets after it is the team that really has all these things handled. That vision of getting after it is communicated. Or they're going to say, we're going to be a physical football team. Well, who says they don't? Have you ever heard anybody say, you know, we really don't want to be a physical football team? Nobody's saying that. The ones who are actually physical football teams, that vision was communicated to them. And the uh, the last piece I want to talk about, uh, Chris, is the uh, avoid petty problems, which uh, I, I think it's one of the big probably issues with coaching, right, is you get those petty problems and you make something that's so small – rather large where it doesn't need to be. So can you talk about this chapter a little bit inside your book, uh, yeah. Avoiding Petty Problems? You know, this probably, you know, the first chapter in the book is about relationships because I really do believe that, you know, relationships is where it's, where it's at because if you don't, um, you know, if you don't have those relationships built in, you can't hardly function as a coach. So that's why it's number one. But if you put these in order of what's most likely to get you kicked out of your job, this would probably be number two. And uh, avoiding these petty, problem, petty problems, meaning we I used to always have a saying I told the guys, you know, like, do you want to be right or do you want to win? Mm-hmm. And sometimes those two things aren't the same. Of course, we love to be right and win. But do you want to be right or do you want to win? Because sometimes this parent comes in with something, this this baseball coach comes in with something, the AD, the principal, the other coach, the other assistant coach, get, and you want to prove to them you're right. You're going to show them that they're wrong and you're right and here's why. And bam. And then you made an enemy for life. You know, I mean, now, granted, there are times you have to pick your battle, but some people are going to pick every battle and that's unnecessary. And if you want to avoid petty problems, then the best example I can give you is to be preemptive, be proactive, you know, put in a lot of groundwork. And so, for example, the best example of that would be like dealing with the if you're a football coach, dealing with the band director, dealing with cheerleading coach, dealing with the basketball coach, dealing with parents in these people who maybe you don't think like you got to bother with until they need something and then they're mad at you. And then you feel like you don't owe them an explanation or something. If you include that cheerleading coach before ahead of time, before they ever emailed you, you just say, Hey, uh, coach so-and-so just want to let you know we're having barbecue, you know, come on out if you want to join, they're never going to come, but you asked them to come, you know, or, you know, you wanted to be in the gym, it's raining, the cheerleading teams in there, the volleyball teams in there, whoever. Maybe you can go in there and throw them out. Maybe you can. But is that really helpful? Right, right, like, right. do you want to be right or do you want to win? You know, because if you make the principal pick between you and the volleyball team, maybe he does pick you or she does pick you. But what did that get you? So you were right, but, you 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 know, you ruined that relationship. If you can find a way to work with them, you know, yeah, it may hit your ego just a little bit to not tell them that you're there all year and you did this and you did that and they did – but that's just unnecessary. It doesn't help you win. I like to win too much to uh, try to be right all the time. Uh, Chris, this has been great. Uh, you know, I appreciate you again taking the time out. Uh, you can see more of Chris's resources uh, at parkerresources.org. We'll have the link in the description below. Uh, Chris, any more, uh, any last words before we sign off? No, I just appreciate you guys having me on. This has become a, like I said, kind of an impromptu passion of mine. And um, I've even had some chance to go back to coaching in the last year or two uh, and really enjoy my day job. I enjoy my family time. But this has really filled that void for me. Of I feel like I'm still able to help. It's not quite the same as with a player, but uh, it really makes me happy to be able to help coaches. So I hope people will reach out. You know, if there's anything on there you don't understand, you got a question about or you know, if you're just broke and need me to send you something for free, that's fine too. I mean, it's not about the money. It's about um, helping coaches, helping the next generation of coaches and ADs and and trying to see the game advance forward. That's awesome. Man. My name is Coach Chris Hedda. That's at Chris Victory on Twitter. Chris Parker, Chris underscore Parker, 222 on Twitter. Parkerresources.org. You can find the book there. You can find all 300 resources as well there. Uh, Chris, thanks again for stopping by. And we'll see yeah, you next time. Yeah, thanks for having me.